Hi, I'm Jackie X and you are listening to Beyond the Grid. Hello everyone, Tom Clarkson here with your weekly installment of Flat Out F1 Conversation. It's Beyond the Grid, presented by Bose Quiet Comfort 35.2 wireless headphones. My guest this week is one of my racing heroes. He's a man who won races in many different categories, including the Le Mans 24 Hours on six occasions. But he had a fantastic Formula One career as well. He was a Nürburgring specialist and he finished runner-up in the World Championship twice. I'm talking, of course, about Jackie X. Unbelievably, Jackie didn't want to be a racing driver. As a young man, he craved a quiet life as a gardener. Yet he stumbled into a driving career, helped hugely by Ken Tyrrell, and he went on to reach the sport's highest heights. Jackie raced in Formula One for 14 years, most famously for Ferrari, with whom he finished second in the World Championship in 1970. He was supremely fast, brilliant in the wet, and he was as brave as a lion. He loves telling a good story too, so grab a cuppa and let's transport you back to one of the sport's golden eras. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Well, Jackie, welcome to Beyond the Grid. It's lovely to have you on the show. Uh, And thank you for inviting me to your home here in Brussels. Absolutely gorgeous apartment. Um, I was going to ask you, first of all, this very simple question. Who has won more professional motor races, you or Mario Andretti? (laughs) Um, I would say probably Mario Andretti, but uh, we have a fairly similar... We have the fairly similar time in motor racing because we came from uh, an era where all drivers were allowed to do a number of, of things at the same time. That means Mario did Indy, uh, NASCAR, uh, Formula One, uh, long distance racing, mid-jet, I think, uh, dirt track. And yes, I did a number of things, including Canam, uh, Formula One, uh, endurance racing, uh, Formula Two, saloon car racing, and uh, and uh, Paris Dakar, probably. Jackie, I think there are many similarities between you and Mario, um, and your paths crossed quite a lot, particularly in the early seventies at Ferrari. Yes. Um, were you friends? Were there many? Do you think there were many similarities between the two of you? I think the first thing, I, in my opinion, you have to understand between the modern era and uh, as we are talking about uh, 50 years ago or more, or 55 or 6 or 7, because we're talking about the 60s roughly, um, racing was different, definitely. But not because we have we had different talents. It's because in those days we were what I would call the freelance professional. No notion of exclusivities uh, between uh, manufacturers and no sponsors. That's the reason why everyone at the time, and it's not an exclusivity from Mario or myself. Jack Brabham, Graham Hill, Jackie Stewart, Jochen Rint, all of us were doing all sorts of racing every weekend. So some years we were about um, 40 years on the, 40 weeks on the track, driving Cortina Lotus or Brab Jack was driving uh, Ford Mustangs. We were together in Formula 2, we were together in Formula 1, we were together because no sponsor, the finance and the economic, economic aspect was not the key of everything. And the aspect of exclusivity was not existing. And that time will never come back. Simply, and it's valid for Mario as well and American uh, drivers as well, will never exist anymore because today uh, the peak of uh, uh, the profession is to be in Formula One in Europe, for example, and I guess uh, Indianapolis or Indy cars. But you can only do one thing at the time. So definitely it reduces the possibilities of victories in every direction. That has changed and sponsoring exclusivities have the same result in a way. So modern drivers are very talented, 
but it's hard to get the same sort of uh, goals, definitely. Do you think you were a better driver for driving so many different types of car? Definitely not. I'm convinced drivers today can do uh, every sort of driving with success, but they are not allowed and they don't have the possibility to do it. Just to... to the, the perfect example, it's... Uh, Fernando Alonso, for example, out of a very long uh, career, unfortunately for him, he was driving a, a poor performance car. Uh, he was allowed to go to Indy, he went to Indy and he was fast immediately. The reality uh, to be successful, uh, <laughs> you need the right tool. So how many races did you win? I have no idea, but many. Many, 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 many. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jackie, let's go back to the beginning. Um, what drew you to motorsport? Your dad was a motorsport journalist, but at what point did you suddenly think, I don't want to write about it, I want to do it? Well, you're going to be surprised in my opinion. I never thought, I never wanted, I never dreamed about being a race driver. I was simply not interested at all. Yep, I'm surprised. <laughs> I always thought I would have loved to have a peaceful life. I would have loved to be a gardener. I would have loved to be a, a gamekeeper, uh, but uh, nothing about car racing. And I remember very well in 55, probably or 56, I went with my father to see Fangio at Franck Orchamps. And um, I remember well having said, please, next time, let me uh, at home. Uh, I was not passionate by what I saw. Even having seen Fangio at Spa Franck Orchamps? Yes. How fantastic. So when did the bug bite you? Well, there are many ways to become a race driver, I suppose. Mine, uh, mine definitely... Is the result of poor, poor result at school. I love the idea. Uh, I love the idea of being next the win next to the window. I love the idea of to be uh, next to the radiator. The radiator. I love seeing the birds flying around. I wasn't disturbing anything, but or anybody. But my results was were bad. Uh, summer vacation was nightmare for me, nightmare for me and my parents. Um, I really had a tendency to forget my exams in my bench at school. And uh, sorry, Dad, I have forgotten it. I give it you uh, next time, and so on. I did a lot of promise to uh, to say I will be better next time. I try hard and so on. And uh, in their desperation, my parents were already uh, always ready. Um, when I was asking for something to give it to me. So when I reached the age of uh, 14, 15, I asked for a little 50cc motorcycle. And they gave it to me because, of course, I promised them to do better uh, the year after. And it was absolutely not my intention. But, um, and then after having heard during all my, all these years that I was bad at everything, I started to, once to compete with a motorcycle, just for the pleasure of it. And I discovered the joy of not being last. So maybe you didn't do your homework at school, but were you a sportsman? Did you have no, a good... No, I did my homework, but it was not really well done. <laughs> <laughs> but were you a sportsman? Did you have good hand-eye coordination or any of the things that would go on to help you in your racing career? No, I don't think so. It was totally unpredictable. That's why the, uh, str the, the path of destiny are so, are so strange, so definitely different than what you can expect. Uh, and the satisfaction is to know that every individual, it's made for something. You only need the luck to find the pad where you have to be on. And definitely uh, that pad uh, was for me, motor, first motorcycle, secondly, uh, car racing. But the real joy, in my opinion, is to know um, 
uh, that you can do something and you can be uh, on top of the list rather than being at the bottom of the list. But and that's really a motivation. Sure, sure. But, 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 but were, you a, were you a rebel? Were you a non-conformist? Were you always going to run off and join the circus, which is what I think of racing drivers? Well, in French we say insoumis or désobéi, désobéi sometimes. But um, it's easy to say what the destiny is when you reach a certain age because the story it's written. And as far as I'm, I am concerned, and I d never, as I told you, desire to be a race driver, but it happened. And it happened because on the path of destiny, you have a lot of people uh, who decide for you or, or give you the opportunity to do some things. Um, and clearly today, I may say that um, I am the result of an, a number of situations uh, due to the, hu the human aspect of life. Your life depends uh, on a number of people you meet, unpredictable, a sentence in a book, a teacher eventually will give you some thought about certain uh, subject. Um, these people make you grow and put you into certain direction that you don't expect. Um, for example, um, on my pad, I always had someone. I was fast in the early day when I was young, um, but I had many accidents in the early days. But it was something acceptable in those days, provided you were fast. Yes, there were people who were trusting uh, my ability to be fast, provide at experience to do it and knowing also the worst sometimes. And these people gave me uh, first my first motorcycle, my second motorcycle, and then I became a, a works driver for Zundap, for example, in uh, enduro racing. And then uh, I had the option to drive uh, Grand Prix racing with the 50cc when I was 16 for Suzuki but I was too young to do Grand Prix, just national races. Then someone came with a BMW 700. I say, you want to drive it? I say, yes, and then they start to win. Then someone came with a Ford Cortina Lotus and I started to, to be with the first, uh, within the first. Then someone came with a Ford Mustang. There is an escalation in speed and performance. And then Ken Tyrrell came who definitely changed completely my life. And um, when I speak about Ken Tyrrell, definitely uh, a father, a family business, uh, Nora Tyrrell, his wife, it was uh, plenty of tenderness and charming thoughts, uh, a manager as well. And uh, you have people who choose you and feels you can do it. And uh, the memories on racing goes much more on the human aspect of the people you have met Can we than talk? personal uh, result. Or because when you have the right tool, and a car is a tool because it's really the word you can use it, this tool, when it's a good one, it's really uh, easy to win in a way. I am the result of hundreds of people that you never saw or gave me the chance and they gave me the talent and their motivation and their experience to drive unbelievable cars who were uh, often winning cars. The difference, I have heard a very interesting comment yesterday. In car racing, really, I think the driver finished the job. The job is done before the start of uh, the race by people you never see. And the driver picks up the the glory at the end. The others as a a pure, natural, incredible satisfaction to have done the job at one hundred percent perfectly. But in motorcycle, for example, I heard yesterday that someone uh, said eighty percent is the driver, and twenty percent it's the bike. And it's easy to understand because on the bike. 
uh, you're outside, you have to balance yourself, there are some angles, you need some strength. Enfin, it's a much more complicated uh, way to drive a, a very fast rocket. So given that you, the rider might have more, more influence in bike racing, why didn't you stick with bikes? Because the destiny forced me <laughs> okay. into something okay. I was not expecting. And when someone, when you are 17 and someone offer you a car to drive, naturally you try it. And then if there is, if there is someone behind that one to offer you to drive a Cortina Lotus in saloon car racing, and you meet John Whitmore or Jochen, uh, Jochen Rind, for example, or Peter Arundel or Jim Clark, or Jack Brabham, uh, who is in a Mustang, definitely that's the way you go. And the two are not possible. But I did race five seasons uh, in motorcycle, and two of these seasons were mixed with saloon car racing and uh, enduro racing. Now, who had the biggest influence on your career? Many people had a strong influence. I think it's a, an addition of situation and put you on a path, unknown path. Sometimes it takes you to the right, sometimes to the left. But a lot of people, I'm really convinced destiny, it's made by other people than yourself. Can I put this to you then? Without Ken Tyrrell, would you have made it? It would have been definitely, I think, different. And I met someone much later who looked very similar to, to him was uh, Carl Haas and uh, Bernie Haas in, uh, in Canam. The human aspect of their attitude was just fantastic and it's very motivating, really. Quite paternal with someone like Ken or Yes, Carl it's Hass. paternal, it's a family. It, mm. It's made out of tenderness. And those, and today now that I have done the largest part of uh, my pad, that's why I'm able to say you are made by other people. We are the result, I am the result of other people's uh, expertise and know-how and, uh, and passion. So it's with Ken that you made it through Formula 3, Formula 2, but how do you reflect on your Formula 1 career? Those, I mean, there were eight wins, 13 poles, runner-up twice in the championship. When you look back at it now, what's the emotion that comes up in you? It's the uh, wonderful thought that uh, that the human aspect into a life it's uh, important. It helps you to understand a lot of things. It's not about mathematics. When I say tenderness or affection, uh, it's a must anyhow in motor racing. If you are loved, although you crash. Um, You have the experience, definitely, but also you are forgiven a number of uh, time, and that's very important. You know, um, uh, Mandela said, I never lose. And he said that because either I won, either I learn. There's no such thing as losing, only learning. Yes, when you had bad moments, you may take it as a lesson as well. Thinking of you as a driver specifically, what were your strengths, do you think, your biggest strengths? Uh, I was very resistant. I was very fit. When you're young, the advantage of being young is to be extremely fit, especially in endurance racing in those days, for example, uh, two drivers, 24,000 kilometers, six hours. I was very resistant, and I saw that also in the Paris-Dakar. I was able to drive very fast for six or seven hours, how eight you, hours. How did you get yourself fit? And uh, your... also, I think the difference, uh, the difference between driver is probably uh, their ego and uh, their desire of winning. Because it's not the speed who is attractive, huh? honestly. The speed, you get used to it uh, very easily. But the attraction and the adrenaline given Um, to you if um, you may win or may, may be belonging to uh, the best is just uh, fantastic. But the rest, it's the timing. It's something you just can't predict. 
The timing is just to be there just at the right moment with the right people who give you the right, uh, the right cow. Yeah, timing is the everything. Timing is very important and uh, you need some luck as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely to, um, probably with, probably with Mario because you, you mentioned Mario and we have some similarities in a way on the durability, uh, the number of things we have done and the high mileage we have done in motor racing. Very, uh, I'm convinced I'm the one with the uh, highest mileage possible in a very difficult or dangerous era. It's not a matter of talent at the end huh? to survive. It's a kind of miracle. It's just pure luck to survive to, to all that. There were many very talented friends and people I've met before uh, who didn't survive it because, but if I calculate the average of number of uh, laps I've done around the, the planet in all sorts of motor racing, uh, it's really a miracle to survive that, that era. Do you ever stop and ask yourself why you survived and others didn't? Pure luck. And because the margin between a dreadful accident and just an accident is very narrow. Very, very narrow. I'm very grateful to uh, my guardian, Angel. I really gave him a very hard time. Originally, his feathers were white at the end. I can tell you they were bloody, uh, bloody gray. <laughs> you had an interesting take on safety at the time. Um, you know, and, and you spent a lot of time with Jackie Stewart. You were teammates together. Um, Jackie was a big driver for safety, wasn't he? And you had, well, actually, you had a slightly conflicting view because on the one hand, you accepted the risks and yet there's that wonderful scene of the start of Le Mans in 69 when everyone's running across the track and you chose to walk and you did up your belts properly before you got the car going and things like that. So it's a slightly conflicting view towards safety. Is that fair? I think we, um, we talked about it uh, a number of times and clearly... Jackie is older than me. He had also very nasty experience at Spa Francorchamps and uh, uh, with other people, with Jimmy and other people, really, uh, they thought it was enough in a way. And we had to progress. And that's, that's the reason why they create the GPDA and uh, just to put some pressure on the organizer to improve the situation. And without any doubt... Uh, Jackie was the leader on that uh, subject and it was held by the French president of the FIA, Jean-Marie Balestre. Together, they have really moved, in my opinion, uh, the racing world into uh, something of what it is today, maybe in excess today, but that's uh, another question. Um, no one wanted to die in those days, neither me, although uh, when you're young and when you uh, want to race, definitely you have to have a limited instinct of conservation, otherwise you're not fast. Because if you start to think of what may happen, definitely it won't help uh, your speed. It was more on the manner. I was always against uh, strikes, and especially when these strikes were... Uh, organized at the last minute. So, uh, but I was concerned. And you say the example of uh, Le Mans, yes. The problem of Le Mans was clearly only one problem. Um, the way the start was, running in your car and trying to go as fast as possible in the race doesn't allow you to put your seat belt on. So that means it forces you in a very difficult time, because you have to remember, 68, 69, 17 were probably the most dreadful years in motor racing. Maybe not the most, because we have forgotten what did happen before the war with the Auto Union, the Mercedes. They were even harder, in my opinion, before. But clearly, I didn't like the idea to be uh, not uh, wearing my seatbelt to run at 330 kilometer per hour with a GT40 for one and a half hour because uh, 
a relay in those days was probably a 130, 140. So I decided to put it on, uh, not to put it on. I start last, okay, the story was nicely, uh, it's a nice story, but it was an inspiration. Um, unfortunately, the, why, the, the, the driver who changed really the start at Le Mans it's the fatal accident of uh, John Wolfe on lap one of the 69 uh, Le Mans. I say he gave me, it was an inspiration really. Unfortunately, he crashed on lap one and he is the one who changed the Le Mans start because he was not uh, wearing his seatbelt at the time. And um, the result is that uh, the ACO clearly decide to change it because it was really the demonstration that it was not valid anymore for for the the future and also nobody it's amusing because nothing would have happened probably a lot of people would have said that i was totally uh, crazy but um, and i was not punished by any kind of uh, comments of saying that I have destroyed the Le Mans start. Oh, it's a reality. Mm -hmm. I gave the inspiration to it, but... Uh, uh, you were so slow at crossing the track, weren't you almost run over? No, I, <laughs> well, that's the only problem, really. <laughs> it's the only problem is that when you go too slow, you risk to be run over by another car that would have been another, uh, uh, another situation, definitely. But you see, there are some stories that you just can't predict how they will turn uh, at the end because I would have finished second. We would have been sitting here and you have told me rather than, uh, rather than walking around and uh, take it easy for the start, wouldn't it be better to start and win with under, rather than losing with 120 meters? But I think that was a hell of an improvement. And also, I think one of the reasons I never told anyone I was going to start like that, because I would have said that to uh, David York or, or to John Ware, you said, you, are you crazy? You idiot? No. But also in the private testing, uh, my co-driver in the GT40 was also Lucien Bianchi. He was driving at an Alfa Romeo. He died in the private practice in Le Mans. So uh, it reinforced my thoughts about wearing seat belts and the advantage of seat belts at the time because there were still some people believing it's better to be ejected from a car than uh, being fixed in it. And that's another reality. You mentioned Lucien Bianchi there. He was the great uncle of Jules Bianchi. Just wanted, did, were you involved? Yes, the in, great, absolutely. Were you involved in Jules' career at all? Not at all. Right. Not at all, because they were two brothers. It's Mauro Bianchi and uh, Lucien Bianchi. Lucien Bianchi, who had a, a quite nice career. We won together uh, uh, Watkins Land with the GT40, and uh, he was just a, a lovely teammate. Now, how difficult was it for you to jump between sports cars and Formula One? Because did they require a completely different mindset? One, obviously, endurance. The other is a sprint event where you're flat out every lap. Was it difficult to adapt? No. <laughs> was no, the philosophy is the same. Huh? <laughs> you just have to adapt yourself to your mm. challenge and your mm. goals. Mm. To, you say that because today... Uh, Today, uh, endurance racing, it's a Grand Prix. But in those days, uh, endurance racing has a sense because it was not the difficulty of the driver reaching the end. It was to take a car where you were not certain, certain to finish, to bring the car at the finish and to save it and to try hard when it was necessary to try hard or conservative when you need it and so on. It, the goals were different, but it's not difficult to drive a, a car. You can do it. And it's not sophisticated as it, it wasn't sophisticated as it was, uh, uh, as it is today. Today it's difficult to be 100% with some engineer saying to you, uh, move that switch up this to uh, minus two, uh, change that. that it, <laughs> uh, 
It was very, I, I would call uh, uh, racing in, in the past like uh, uh, the Stone Age in a way. It's fairly easy to fix, very little things to do. You just have to drive, drive it. Of course, there are no assistants. You have to be f physically fit, but it's not complicated. But did you have to drive differently? So at Le Mans, for example, to get that car to the end of the race, were you, I don't know, double declutching or doing anything to, yes, to, that, that to preserve yes, the car, but that's which you wouldn't do in That's what I was trying to say. You have to preserve the car to finish it because there were no guarantee that a car could finish Le Mans uh, the first time they were there. Yes, you have to be conservative when it's necessary. Now? No. <laughs> Jackie, you and the wet. Why were you so darn good in the wet? Because I did a lot of motorcycle before. Explain to me why that helped you in the wet. Because you, <laughs> it's easy. Because, because with a motorcycle, you have two, uh, two wheels. And uh, that doesn't forgive any uh, wrongdoing. You need a lot of sensitivity as far as the adherence on the track is concerned and also to be very uh, tender with the throttle. I, I never liked the wet, huh? but oh, wow. I was better than some others on the wet conditions. Nobody likes the wet in motor racing. I don't know anybody uh, who likes the wet, in my opinion. But it's true that I was doing fairly well. Do you think Even Nicky knows that. Even Nicky Loda knows that I was not, I'm not too bad in, uh, on the wet. Do you think you left less margin in the wet than other people? No. I was more comfortable maybe, but I had also different lines. And I had, you, are I they different from lines, for well? example, uh, I'm sorry, I can't resist to the temptation uh, to say, I mentioned Nicky. Simply, for example, at Brand Satch at the race of uh, champion, I passed Nicky uh, via the outside at uh, Paddock Bend, it, and it's something that nobody, enfin, a number of people did try it before, but they never succeed. But I managed to do it, and it's still, it was Nicky, who oh, it's uh, the future multi uh, world champion. What did he say to you after the race? He didn't say anything because. Um, Luckily, he didn't see me trying the first time, and the second time I knew how to do it. But uh, he was surely surprised in a way. But Jackie, a lot of the drivers today learn their wet weather lines through karting, and you never karted. So was it just... No. Where did you learn these... Motorcycle. It is all back to the motorcycle, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just motorcycle. I have always been a great admirer of Sammy Miller or Gordon Jackson, who oh, it's still the RDA the iconic uh, drivers in trial, for example. Um, I was nearby those who were doing enduro racing in those days, and uh, I'm convinced that helped a lot, and it also helped me in the Paris Dakar race as well. How to read. Uh, how to read a surface and how to handle, uh, to be in the middle of nowhere without any tracks, with a very uh, a road book, very limited road book, giving you only really directions rather than difficulties. And um, yes, motor motorcycle has helped me a lot. Do you remember um, about 10, 12 years ago, it must have been 2006, I think, Valentino Rossi tested for Ferrari in Valencia and he was very serious about joining the team. Um, never happened, but do you think he would have gone well? I'm sure he would have done well. Because um, of everything yesterday, the bike racing. Yesterday, Andrea De Vizioso, De Vizioso tried a, a DTM car and uh, he was good very quickly. And before him, we had Mike Iwood, who was perform performing very well too in motor racing. And before him, we had John Surtis doing it uh, very well. Uh, but as I said, you are put on a pad and logically you try a number of things, but your job is to do what you have made, be made for. 
but some did it really. Don't forget, uh, 30s was a 500 world champion and he was also a Formula One champion. Maybe the so pressure. Would there have is been no to... rule. There yes, is no of rule. course, the pressure. Pressure for are, Rossi at Ferrari would have been uh, huge. Wouldn't it? Yeah. Actually, of, well, look, we're talking about Ferrari. Uh, I can't think of a better man to tell me about Ferrari than you, because was it five out of six seasons? I did were, five seasons with them. Yeah. How did you find the old man Enzo Ferrari? I'm amused by uh, that question because um, when driver made some comments about Ferrari, they always say it was nice, da, 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 da. but there, there is always a but. That but I don't have. I always had the best car possible and never felt considered differently by, uh, uh, with my teammate. We were getting the best, equal. Um, he really treated me very well with a lot of patience and uh, in very nicely way. And today I think he was a very, at the contrary that people think, he was a very sensitive and tender person. Was he intimidating in any way? No, I think he knew, in my opinion, the reason he never wanted to be too close to the driver was simply because he lived that era where racing was dangerous. Before I was born and uh, when I was young, and he never wanted to stay too close to those who were driving for him because he knew that the danger was in Formula One was a reality. But, uh, and that's what I, say, I can say today. I never felt discriminated. I never felt being put under pressure. I never felt uh, into a political, to fall into a political battle for Italy or Italian or cars and so on. So I have a really a different, a real different opinion of many people about it. Could yes. you speak Italian or can you speak Italian? Si, yes, And I at the time you could? Yes, I can. Jesus, how much did that help you, being able to communicate directly with him? But we were speaking in English, I oh, know. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. I could, yes, I've learned Italian, uh, at, uh, at Ferrari in those days. And um, it was very human once again. Uh, going to Brand Satch or going to Silverstone uh, with one truck with two or three cars, uh, two or three engines, six mechanics maybe, and uh, uh, you had to change in your own car or in the truck. No mobile home, no motor home, no hospitality unit. But we had that fantastic pleasure at midday uh, to cook the spaghettis uh, in the truck, uh, to have the bottle of uh, gas to cook it, uh, the prosciutto, la grana, uh, a glass of uh, wine. And, uh, well, you will hear the, the, the name human in my comments very often because out of one life, a racing life, or out of every life in the way, what makes you smile and what is positive about it is the people you meet, the number of people uh, you can meet. And today, uh, many of the people I have known are gone, but I remember them as a, an important, important meeting, important, an important relationship, a lot of tenderness, uh, a big help, people ready to help. All these people make you, in a way. What was Maranello like back then? What was it like? Can you remember the first time you drove into Maranello? It's luckily when you're young, you don't realize, you think a lot, number of things are normal. And uh, as it was not part of my dream, and uh, I just uh, felt lucky but I didn't feel it was something exceptional. It's afterward you realize that you had a good time, a very good time. Some years good, sometimes less good. Sometimes you do uh, the good choice. Sometimes you make the wrong choice. It's part of life. You learn. But uh, there was the uh, restaurant in front of the factory who hasn't changed. It's still the same today. The entry, it's still the same. Uh, 
the old man was sitting at the table in the restaurant for lunch. Did you ever pay for a meal in that restaurant? That I don't remember. <laughs> You're a Ferrari driver. I'm sure I can tell you that you didn't, or no? No, 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 because if you want a Ferrari, you had to pay for it eh, in <laughs> those days. <laughs> I did. Really. I remember having two or three Ferraris in those days. You have to pay for it. And you, of course, you have a small discount, but uh, it's not a gift. You have to... Uh, he made you pay for your cars. So. Yes, definitely. I'm not the only one, almost everyone. But uh, he had that huge table where he was receiving everyone. And I'm convinced that table still exists today. And the seat of Enzo Ferrari at that table where there can be maybe eight or ten seats... His seats, nobody take it, still today. So Jackie, why did you leave? Why? Why did you leave the team at the end of 68? I leave the team because um, uh, the performance were, uh, of the car were very poor. Um, we had to stop after the British Grand Prix. Uh, we took two months off of the season. Uh, and um, there is a usual fight between the engineers and the drivers and uh, there were some feelings that maybe it wasn't fast enough or the car was, I don't know. But I did drive for McLaren, for example, one race in 73, who was the most dreadful season I had with Ferrari. I drove uh, the McLaren at the Nürburgring, their spare cars, Third car, spare car, I finished third. Uh, I was immediately fast again. Of course, I know the Nürburgring well, but um, I, I heard a very interesting comment uh, in uh, Australia or New Zealand only a year ago, a few months ago, coming from field care, for example. I was fast in practice, but they decided to give me a hard compound for the race. And that was not the case for Tyrell uh, with Jackie and uh, Francois at the time. And he said he always regretted to have forced me to, uh, to, to run on hard ties rather than the medium or, or soft ones. And, um, but he gave me, lending, lending me the car for the German Grand Prix. And it's something I did totally against Ferrari. That's why I say disobey. I say, you don't give me a car, I need to, to race. I took that car. I was faster than Dennis. I was faster than Peter Revson. I was third fastest in practice with an engine who was really not the best one, in my opinion. But he gave me, that gave me the confidence that at least I was not in cause for their trouble. And then... Later on, uh, they went with that chassis made in England and so on. And, and I still had the offer to join. I still ha had the offer to join for 74. But I didn't take it because probably uh, I was exhausted of having all sort of unsatisfaction of not being in the, uh, within the top. And I took the, uh, the Lotus 72. or was a mistake. We'll, we'll come on to that later, but why did you leave at the end of 68? What did he say to you? You went to Brabham for a year, didn't you? And did you feel... In 68? Ah, did no. You, did, he feel, did you feel you were being no, disloyal? No, not at all. No? Not at all. It's because in, in 68, I was driving for Ford in long distance, John Wire, and Ferrari, and that was accepted. And Ferrari had nothing to offer me in long distance. So I chose to continue on the offer of Brabham because I was still a kid at the time. I still had an experience to build up. So a Gulf Oil was the sponsor of Brabham and the GT40. So I chose to do the season with these two. And we never lost contact with Ferrari. They knew the reason why I was doing it. And in 1970, they offered me to join again because there was a project with the 512 and other things. They were able to offer me um, a full program, let's say. 
and that's why I returned because I never left in bad ter- in in bad terms. Also in seventy three, we leave each other in very good terms, and uh, without any unfair or unpleasant comments. Sometimes you have to find new paths, new road, new motivation. Probably the time was just the the right one to do one, but probably not the accurate one. That's <laughs> that's. Uh, I think in a Jackie in another life you would have been a diplomat because I can't think of another driver that left Ferrari and got invited back. Because I never had any uh, bad comments. Sure, well, sure, but, but because I never, yeah. I, I never felt. I never felt uh, in competition or being in a situation to have pressure on it. He really liked me and I really liked him. And prob- the only sadness is maybe you take some time before you realize the qualities of humans around you because it's clear that uh, to be a winner, you need a big ego. And the ego brings you into, into certain satisfaction or in, into situation where you put your ego first, maybe, and um, had no reason to be uh, unhappy with Ferrari. I was unhappy with the results some year. One year good, one, one year bad. But we could have done much more if we wouldn't had really little stupid failure like uh, uh, a master switch or an alternator, or, but we were in really, uh, the car was really good. And for Yeri, he was able to do it uh, once every two years, a good car, because the job is still very empiric in those days. It's a sort of guess, you know. Now we know what we have to do. It's not necessarily the good thing. Today it's really, it's mathematic. That's the difference. Can I ask you about two seasons in particular, 69 and 70? Um, second in the championship. That 69 season, as you say, you'd gone to gone to Brabham. Um, what are your memories of working with Sir Jack and, and just with obviously competing against Jackie Stewart on the track as well? Mm. Before I had 68, I won one Grand Prix, probably finish uh, fourth in the championship. But I had a broken leg in uh, the Canadian Grand Prix because the throttle um, stayed open uh, in a corner and then I tried to fix it and they tried to fix it and then... uh, I had the, um, the throttle stuck uh, a second time and then uh, a third time and the third one was a good one. So I, I crashed badly. I was lucky to have only a broken leg. So I didn't do Le Mans afterwards and so on. Um, but um, as there was the offer of Brabham, Jack who was world champion uh, with a very good car. The leader of my car was Ron Dennis. It's Ron Dennis who took care of uh, my car in 69. And the amazing things, because he had, a, he had an amazing career in a way, uh, Ron. He never wanted too much to talk about it, but he made the car run in such a way that when Jack wasn't there anymore, because he had a broken leg also, I think, uh, yes, I was able to win and to be a real contender for a number of races. And also I was building up a certain experience and uh, I was faster than the previous year. And definitely uh, Jackie Stewart deciding not to join Ferrari. Um, it was an open door for me to join Ferrari uh, in the early 70s with a huge program. I must just ask you a bit more about Ron Dennis. Um, there is not much to say because he's a very secret man. But how did you My find admiration him? comes to the fact that he was uh, a mechanic. But was he very organized? What stood out about he, him? He was exactly as you have known him later and if you have uh, known him. Dedicated, knew what he wanted, he wanted to succeed. 
and he did an incredible job and he did it on my car as well. Did, did you like him? Uh, I didn't dislike him, that's for sure. Uh, the man I was in a relation with was Ron Toronac, most of the time, who conceived the car in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I drove the car uh, not so long ago. It was difficult to enter in it, so it makes you realize that uh, you don't have exactly the same size uh, like uh, 50 years ago. Well, Jackie, how tall are you? I mean, you're like a jockey. You're not. I'm 173 uh, yeah. centimeter. Yeah. So when you're... I'm not a jockey. The jockey, uh, Alain Prost, and uh, and guys like that, they are really. I don't know how much they are, 63, 60, 58, yeah. I don't know. I think Alain is lighter now than he was when he was racing. Yes, because he does, he does like you, a lot of uh, cycling. Yeah, he's, a, he's a properly obsessed, I think. He is totally obsessed. Yeah. I told him the other day, you must have already uh, run 5,000 kilometers a year. He said, no, 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 not 5,000, 10,000. <laughs> Oh, if only I had the time, Jackie. But look, what about 1970 then? Um, uh, the season is sort of forever remembered for Jochen Rint's posthumous world championship. You were second. Is there any bit of you that is pleased that you didn't win the championship and didn't take it away from Jochen that year? I can't... Re you see, I'm amazed. I'm really amazed that even the qu question came because... He had the highest number of points, although uh, uh, although he didn't do the last four Grand Prix. He had the highest score. And the, que the, the question was to say, uh, uh, do we give the title posthumously? Uh, for me, it was an evidence. And probably... Is the is the best thing that may happen to me is not to win uh, the championship uh, that year. He deserves to have it. He had the largest number of points, and um, everybody would have said, "Well, Rint, if he, he would have been here, would have won it." But mathematically, it was done. So I'm really surprised that there was a question on that. It's it's a good. It's really a good luck not having won it. That was not the year to win it with somebody who couldn't couldn't defend his chances. What are your memories of Monza, nineteen seventy? Mm. The thought, the, the same thought I had when I was winning the French Grand Prix and uh, uh, Georges Lesser died at the French Grand Prix in sixty-eight. I won. He, he was uh, probably 38 or 39 years old. He was driving for the first time the new uh, Honda Formula One. He killed himself in uh, one of the high speed corner and uh, it was uh, only sadness, only sadness. But it was common in those days. Huh? It was part of the job, accepted as a fatality, which not because having two major or three major crashes every year was not accepted, acceptable, definitely. But uh, I remember him on a Friday, the Friday evening we went to a place where they were presenting, uh, you remember Polystyl? Made small car, made like Burago, same type of toys, a replica of cars and so on. We went to a party uh, in the um, in the park, or the park of Monza, and we exchanged because we had the feeling, we had the feeling that evening to be trapped into a system where that we could not control by uh, by uh, a model maker or were using us as a. And he said, well, we have been strong. The next day, he was dead. Charming person. And we fight also. Uh, we had unbelievable fights at uh, the German Grand Prix at Okenheim. We overtook each other for many, many laps with a lot of courtesy, pass to the right, pass to the left. And it was probably one of the most fascinating Grand Prix uh, 
we had definitely. I mean, one thing is other drivers being killed, but how did your own accidents affect your motivation and your attitude towards racing? I mean, we you talked about breaking your leg in Canada, but in was it Harama 1970 when you yes. you had the, uh, that fiery crash as well? It's did motivated. That it you? motivated even more in the way that you want to recover as quickly as you can, like motorcycle driver. That is the only thing. And that's the, for doctors, is the amazing part. Uh, yes, I had a broken leg, uh, I had steel, uh, steel in the leg. A month and a half later, I was at uh, Kailami driving with a, a steel bar outside of the leg, and I was winning the nine hours, and uh, there were no doctors to complain, to say uh, you're not allowed to drive a race car. And so we were free and maybe a little bit, uh, maybe. <laughs> Jackie, can you just elaborate? You, you were driving with a metal rod. Yes, I went outside. to, I, I went to, uh, well, yeah, yes, I went to uh, the uh, Mexico Grand Prix a uh, few weeks after, but it's common today, eh? When Valentino Rossi breaks uh, the two bones of his leg, uh, three weeks after he's back and he raced and he was the fastest, on, he was on pole position. It's nothing extraordinary. In my opinion, it's nothing extraordinary. You want to recover, you want to be back. After the Spanish Grand Prix where I was badly banned with skin graft and all these things, uh, I was back uh, at the Monaco Grand Prix. And I was very happy, of course. I have to care to take care of myself a little bit on certain aspect, but it's normal. God, extraordinary. Now, um, you touched earlier on, on leaving Ferrari midway through 73. And then from that point onwards, do you feel that mentally you were more focused on sports cars? Because yes, you there was Lotus, there was Ligier, there was et cetera, but... How would you sum up what happened to you in Formula One after Ferrari? To climb up the mountain of the sport, you have the strength for it. Uh, you don't see the bad part of it. You don't see the difficulties. You climb the mountain. To stay on top the the mountains, you have to pay attention and uh, you think you know where you go and so on. But anyhow, your worst enemy remains the time passing. That's your worst enemy. And at the end, it will beat you, for sure. Then comes uh, the bad choice. Clearly for me to choose uh, Lotus at the time uh, was not a good idea. In front of me, uh, the very talented uh, Ronnie Peterson, uh, was in the Ferrari team as well with me and uh, it was not a danger for me. We were competitive and we were fighting against each other. But definitely with Lotus, I was unable to, uh, in the early days, to follow him. Plus the fact that I must admit I had a number of, let's call them, unfortunate failure on, uh, uh, on a number of things. And uh, if you're not confident in your car anymore, Technically, uh, it's not as easy. So uh, there was a new car coming who was not really performing well and we decided to leave. I'm saying all that because it's hard to go up, it's hard to stay, but the downhill, it's always very slippery. And then you hope to be able, because you need a, to win, you need a good tool. You always wish to have the luck to go back with a good car, with a good team, and with that group of people who give you the best. Oh, can I say errands? There was a sort of errands. I tried many things without having the feeling I had a good opportunity. My luck, my luck, because there is still some luck sometimes. Yes, I stay around for a few years uh, doing some... Uh, uh, freelance job for for Frank Williams or for Maurice Noon with the Enzyme um, without real success. 
my luck, my luck, my pure luck has been the fact that Ligier, missing uh, De Paillet, had to take me as the second driver for their uh, Ligier in the second half of the season, 79. And um, it's a win car, a win effect that I don't know really well at the time, but that's not a problem. I was not the first choice. It was not a problem also. But I realize, I realize, and that's why I say it's pure, it's really lucky. I realize I wasn't ready to give the last three tenths of seconds or makes the difference between a winner and just a contender. So I decided to leave at the, the, at the end of 79 because I was beaten by the motivation and the time running. So I took a year off and then I restarted some extra years into a different category or back to endurance racing where it was motivated with Porsche, very motivating and also less demanding as far the last extra tens of second to look for. And then that was the reason uh, I returned into it. That's how it makes, and that's for 10 years, because I did that 76, 70. I was doing also endurance racing and some races formula one time to time. And um, I think that makes me uh, 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 the driver or one the, the the greatest number of endurance racing uh, because I won maybe 48 long distance race counting for the world championship of uh, makes and drive also because the, ch the championship for drivers was not existing in the early days, but that makes me winning Daytona, Sebring, uh, Le Mans, uh, Monza, Spa, uh, many other races. So that's why I say the results are definitely linked to those you meet. You understand what I'm trying to say? You, yes. you will say I will always come back. I love to say I'm the result of uh, those people I have met who made me uh, win all these races. Um, Jackie, just that, that 79 Ligier gave you a, an insight into the whole, as you say, wings and ground effect and um, how the cars must have changed, the F1 cars changed during your career is quite extraordinary. Yes, I drove almost every everything, but... Um, totally different driving style. Yes. From start to yes, finish. Yes, but that's also maybe... Uh, if you are honest with yourself or realistic, you know well before the others what you can do and what you cannot do anymore. Probably that's one of the reasons why I have been able to last so long. Um, I was fairly realistic about a racing life and the possibilities. And then it's much easier to leave before you are thrown out. And that changed, the, that changed the whole thing. So, best F1 car you ever drove? All the winning ones. <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, I, I, but it's, if you ask to a driver which track you prefer, I can guarantee you no one will, will say a track where he hasn't won. I'm convinced. Yeah. And just imagine the number of races I have won globally. Well, that's I mean, a, it's honestly, it's amazing. Well, that's a lot speak. of tracks. A lot of tracks I that love, you could claim uh, to be your best. Maybe it's a lack of humility, but uh, in the United States, they say, I'm one of the great. I think it, that's probably the best description, the more honest description. And I think it's a fantastic satisfaction to know that you are not classified as, as one of the good ones, but you're classified in one of the great. And I think that's a really, I love that description because yes, when you look back, all I've won from uh, Saloon car racing to uh, the Paris-Dakar, it's, it's a lot. 
It's huge versatility. Yes, it's mm. huge. Mm. It's unusual and it will not exist anymore because you're not allowed to do it anymore. Yes, you can be become three, four, five, six times world champion, but you will do only one thing at the time. And we were able to do everything at the, t the, the time with a, a super human aspect because we met almost every weekend, same hotel, same people, same friendly, friendly atmosphere, a real community. So are you going to give me your best F1 car or are we going to move on? I drove the other day the B1, who is owned by Paolo Barilla. He restored fully uh, uh, the B1 Ferrari. That was a lovely car. Really lovely car. Best driver you ever raced? Mm. I will not answer to that. I will answer differently. I've been having... I have a huge respect for Fangio, although I didn't race against him, because I think he comes from an era, he raced every weekend in a very dangerous era. He survived from it and he won five championships. Um, I loved Jim Clark. For me, in a way, he was the most res respectful driver and gentleman that you could meet, really a charming person. Um, Jackie Stewart, because he was the man to beat in those days. He was the reference. Being in front of him was a, a hell of satisfaction. Probably I would have loved to make my experience uh, sharing uh, uh, the same team with Ken and him. But unfortunately, uh, it didn't work because uh, the French wanted to, uh, to have a French driver when there was the change. So uh, I'm sure Ken, with regret, says uh, I can make it. But that has opened me at the age of 73, the door of Ferrari. What about Ronnie? What about Ronnie Peterson? What about Nicky Lauda? Do you still place people like Jim Clark and Jackie Stewart above those guys? In every sport, there is always someone who is a little bit better than the others. Ronnie didn't have the chance, in a way. He, had, he was unfortunate. You need some luck to survive and to be able to speak about the destiny of someone. The one of uh, Ronnie ended, unfortunately, at Monza. The one uh, of uh, Nikki almost ended uh, in 76 at the Nürburgring, but after that he has been three times world champion. And uh, I drove with him once from uh, Graz to Vienna on the road. He wasn't speeding, but you knew he had the style. You know, I was two or three years older than him, four years older than him. And we were together. We came back from a style Puk and the Puk motorcycle factory to do some testing with him. Uh, and I was sitting next to him and I knew immediately it was good. Just from sitting Not next about, to him? Yes. What was it impressive? Precise, precision, comfortable, safe, you know, clinic. But not running at 180 kilometers per hour, huh? Normally on the road, you knew. Now you say that Jackie Stewart was the reference in the he's late. The re he's still the reference <laughs> on many, as on many, many aspects. You see, after the advantage sometimes with the years passing through, really, we are the survivors. Him or me or Nikki and few others who lived that period. We are the few left on the scene in a way, uh, because you have to remember at least a good third disappear in uh, car racing, maybe a even a little bit more. Uh, he was the mid, the, the man to beat. Uh, I love to say that uh, he disliked me a lot and I dislike him a lot too, because we had different view on number of things, GPDA, safety and everything. 
But you see, after 50 years, when we meet, we both knew we live an incredible era, but we both knew also that we are survivors. And we are happy to see uh, each other. Because in common, we have fantastic moments, but also very sad moments that we have shared and that we can't explain to anyone. Needs no words. And uh, he's still the refer. I think he's still not only the reference as far being a three times world champion, he's also a reference because he did what he did for safety. He played a key role into the modern safety of motor racing. And also he has shown us also he was the very first one to realize how to use as as Jochen Rin, but Jochen Rin did leave it, how to uh, become a professional as far the concern of sponsoring, how to promote yourself, how to uh, make your public relation and so on. And if you look at him today, he's still there with his Scottish pants uh, at, uh, he still he still is for 50 years the Rolex uh, ambassador. And you knew, you know it's him. When he was in uh, in Formula One doing the, uh, he did only 100 Grand Prix, huh? in Formula One. He had that uh, um, cap, uh, velvet uh, black cap who is specified with the same glasses. He really teach everyone. He was the very first one to go into it and to under, and he always did that very well. Jackie, I've got, I'm going to, yes, everything you say about Jackie Stewart is true, but you were pretty. And he's the only one who can have dinner with the, the queen for uh, <laughs> his 80th his, uh, his year. Huh? It's just to tell you that uh, yeah. he's really performing. Who went there? The queen no, at the is, age of 93. Went to Jackie's 80th birthday. Yes. But can I just say you. Is it true? Yes. I, huh? well, I, I think she might have I been. heard that. I yeah, mean, I, I heard so. it. And I did frankly. I believe it's true. Yeah, it is possible to believe, isn't it? But you, he when, always you, when you're talking about how cool, when, when you're talking about how cool Jackie Stewart was, you, Jackie X, were pretty darn cool as well. You had some cool shades. You had the looks. You had the life in the '60s and '70s as well. I'm nodding at you. Yes, but uh, in those days, it was normal. You were rock and roll, Jackie X. Uh, no. Oh, come on. No, no, not, no. <laughs> but we used to go to bed late, all of us. Uh, we used to uh, drink a glass of wine, yes. Uh, some of us were smoking uh, cigarettes. Some of us were sponsored by cigarettes, but were not smoking. Um, the evenings were funny. When we were in Formula 2, to Albi and Poe, and they were, uh, when John Coombs, John Coombs, who was running Graham Mills, Matra, where was cutting the, uh, the tie of Jack Brabham in the evening. Yes, we have a real, it was a real enjoyable community. But I was young in it, it's true. Because still in those days, it was, only experienced people were supposed to uh, drive the nice and big toys. I was one of the young ones, really. I was not the average. No, and today, today, the difference, and I think it's exactly what we need, you have to trust the young people. Look what Formula One is. You are mature or almost mature at the age of 17, 18 you're able to drive a very sophisticated Formula One car and you do it very, very, very well. That will reduce in, in a way the time you are allowed to do it at very high level. Because honestly, I think young people are soon or late being unbeatable. The, the point I was going to make about Jackie being the reference, Jackie Stewart, was that Yes, he was very quick, but I put it to you that no one was faster around the Nürburgring than you. Well, that's the advantage. When the people, when your opponent thinks it's a track made for another one, let them believe that you are the best. Why were you so good at the, at the ring? It's, it, you had a phenomenal I record. I was good. There. I was good. For the main reason, I did 
two times a race called the 86 horse of the Nürburgring. It was a regularity race or replaced Liège, Rome Liège, or was a famous rally uh, for many, many years. They didn't know how to reach Rome or Sofia because it exists also as Liège, Sofia, Liège. So they decided to do a regularity race at the Nürburgring. And I did it two times, 86 hours, two drivers. I was doing 14 hours during uh, the day. And my co-pilot, eight hours during the night because he was a rally driver and he was more planned for it. When you have done uh, something like uh, 200 laps at the Nürburgring, at the end, if you have not learned something, you, have a ma- you really have a big problem. So I knew where I was going and also at having done a lot of motorcycle as far as jumps went concerned, no fear to have a, a mechanical failure because for, Formula 1 or Formula 2 were not made to jump. Huh? And at the Nürburgring in those years, there were 17 jumps. That means 17 times the car was taking off some 40 centimeter or even 50 centimeter high, some only three uh, inches or two inches, but that's the way it was. Yes, at the Nürburgring, it was not bad. You were very good. <laughs> Jackie, just a couple more questions. Um, where do your six Le Mans victories fit in your, how you look back at your career? Are they your proudest achievement or are the victories in Formula One more important? I'm not a calculator. Um, I took, I think I realized everything is granted and unexpected in a way. Um, That makes me think I didn't answer about a very important question. You say, yes, you are... um, you are performing at the best. You try to reach also a 100% efficiency on a race course. But you have asked me, there are some races you remain as really exceptional. Yes, once, time to time, you perform at under 10% and it works. And you try everything and everything works. And that really exists. Uh, the way you can sublimize yourself and sublimize the others as well. It's really an incredible experience. Everybody speaks about 69 Le Mans because honestly, it's a, fairly, ever finished. It's a f- fairly extraordinary story. Yes, because the finished for five fours, nobody knew who was going to win uh, because uh, the timing was good. Tire change, same lap. Refueling, same lap. Brake pad change, same lap. And we could not leave each other. And also, it's the first pick 69. It's the first black and white picture of Le Mans taken from a, a Breguet Atlantic. It's an airplane. They opened the door of that military airplane. They put the camera into it with a cameraman so they could follow almost the last five or four hours from the bottom, but also from the sky. So it was the first time you could live really a a race like that lives. So all these ingredients put together made a a success of... uh, of Le Mans. But 77, for example, uh, we were, uh, once again, we were, I lost my car after three hours, so I was the reserve driver of the other car, of Porsche, or was last two, some 41st position. And uh, the fascination was coming from the fact that you can drive at Le Mans without limit, because everything is, is lost any, anyhow. You have lost the race, so you can go flat out. And then when you see every hour that you can gain few places and in the morning, in the morning, suddenly you realize you are second and you realize everything is possible. It's just fascinating for all of us because 
probably if you ask the people who live that moment, the mechanics and the driver or early I would and everything, they all say I really uh, drove an incredible race because I run in the night with fog and rain, rain again. Um, I went, uh, I was doing two, three stints in a row, one stop, one stint stop, three, and, uh, three other stints behind. I drove flat out the whole night and I bring that car to the top and the other said, bring it too, doing unbel an unbelievable performance with a car who had no ref counter, for example. We did the whole race without ref counter. Intentionally, you just switch no, it off. No, it, so uh, it was right. broken, so you had to do it oh, only okay. listening. Okay. And then at the end, uh, the last so we were on five cylinder instead of six. You had plus the fear to have done all that for nothing. <laughs> it's just fantastic. Brand Schatz, 83, when I won the, the title, the first title was allowed in long distance at Brand Satch. It was just an incredible race as well. Yes, sometimes you can sublimize yourself mm. and it's fascinating and many, other, many others. But I'm the first one to say it only happened time to time. The motivation will push you to the extreme and everything works. Yeah. So sometimes you try things normal and nothing works. <laughs> That happens too in motorsport, and it's happened it? too. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you have to dare, <laughs> and you have to believe everything is possible. And we had few examples at Le Mans during these last few years. Yeah, the Toyota not finishing uh, the, the last, last lap. lap. Yeah. It's incredible, but, but until you haven't passed the checkered flags, you still have to believe in it. Well, Jackie, thank you so much for your time. What a fascinating chat. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure. What a wonderful career. I could have listened to Jackie all day. He lived through such a fascinating era and he's still such a good storyteller. He remembers everything like it was yesterday. One particular highlight was his description of Maranello in the 60s and what it was like to have lunch with Enzo Ferrari. I also love the idea of him being made to pay for his Ferrari road cars. I'm not sure that's the case for Sebastian Vettel and Charles Leclerc these days. Thanks for your time, Jackie. It was a pleasure to meet you. Well, that's it for this episode, but we'll be back next week with another fascinating guest from the world of F1. And I promise you, this man has stories that you won't want to miss. And thanks for your feedback about last week's episode with Alex Wurtz. You guys loved hearing from him, and not only for his racing stories. Just finished listening to Alex Wurtz. What a man, says Paddy McGinley. I loved hearing about, well, just about everything. Didn't think the details of circuit design would be so interesting. It's all in those different types of asphalt, Paddy. Alex is one of life's achievers. I'm sure he's destined for even greater things outside the cockpit of a racing car. But please keep your feedback coming. We love it, especially when you've been really surprised by a guest. Remember to use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid and you can tweet me at Tom Clarkson F1. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audio Boom. Until next time, keep it flat out.